Well, I'm a bit overwhelmed to find so many people here wanting to hear what I have to say. It's wonderful. It's, it's truly wonderful. Thank you. So, the subject of the day, where did the towers go? Let's see. Well, once upon a time, there were two towers. Then they went away. That material there is all that was left of that building. That's building three. A lot of people overlooked that building. And this is the remains of tower two, about the lobby size down there. To remind you of how big of a mass was there. And then it is gone. This picture was taken on 9-11. Where is all the debris? But everybody wants to know who did it. They just have to know who did it. And so they jump to the conclusion, ah, but the planes did it. No, it was bombs in the building. No, it was thermite. And pretty soon there's just answers all over the place of, of what they think it could be. Spray on thermite, fourth generation, mini nukes. Just throwing out answers. You can't really find the answer that way. Because if you had uh, a dead body you came upon, how, how did it die? Well, we found a smoking gun. So now we know it had to be the gun that did it. But then it turns out uh, you found the dead body underneath the garage door. Ah, the garage door must have done it. Wait a minute, maybe he was poisoned. So guessing the answer with just a few details is not a good way to go. I don't know if many of you heard about this case that really was just oversaturated in our media. This case of uh, Casey Anthony, a mother accused of killing her child, and then was found not guilty because, and everyone was shocked, not everyone, but the people who were following the story were shocked. But the next day, Jennifer Ford, one of the jurors, um, getting feedback here, um, spoke uh, to the media saying they did not know how the child died. <coughs> How can you convict somebody of a crime if you don't know what crime they even committed? The jury did not know what happened. So finding out what happened is the most important thing. Then you can determine how it happened, who was involved, why they did it. But what we're going to concentrate on because it's the most important thing, is what happened. The main thing of what happened, the towers didn't burn up, nor did they slam to the ground. They turned into dust in midair. How do we know that? Wait, does that look like a collapse to you? We were told it was a collapse. We were, we were basically brainwashed into reacting to this picture like flashcards. Memorize the word collapse when you see this. But that's not a collapse. If they had hit the ground, if they had slammed into the ground, there would be over a million tons of debris piled up on the ground. But that didn't happen. If they had slammed to the ground, Manhattan would have been flooded because the bathtub which holds out the Hudson River, would have been ruptured. We'll talk about the bathtub a little bit more. And that didn't happen. And if they'd slammed to the ground, the seismic readings would have recorded two 500,000 ton buildings slamming to the ground, plus a 230,000 ton building slamming to the ground. And that didn't happen. So we first are going to determine what happened by looking at these three main areas and then there's a whole host of other areas we'll look at as well. So here we have what was left after the towers went away. Only buildings with a WTC prefix were destroyed that day. 
really hardly anything else was even scratched. A few damaging things here and there, but nothing um, catastrophic that couldn't be repaired. That's all that was left of the North Tower. North wall, the south wall, and a little bit of stairwell B. Now the towers were steel structures with aluminum cladding on the outside. Well, you see a few pieces of aluminum cladding laying around. Yeah, you get a steel piece there. But right in front of the front door, why don't you have piles of steel structure? And there's this ambulance in pretty much pristine condition. Maybe the door got done a little bit. But I don't see any big piece of steel clobbering the top of it. And we know the park uh, ambulance is at ground level, not up in space. So that's ground level. Here's a newscast from the 24 hours uh, later. Down in lower Manhattan today, George. I don't know if you heard a little earlier uh, me raise this question, which was asked, actually raised by ABC's Jackie Judd, as we look at these areas down below, and the video of where the towers used to stand and where is all the rubble gone. And have you, have you been able to, and is there any way you can answer that question? I'm sorry, Peter, I didn't get the question. Okay, I apologize. Jackie Judd and several other people keep asking us, when you look at where the towers used to stand, there is surprisingly so little rubble. Where did all the rubble well, go? It's a very good question, Peter, and I have asked some people who've been doing some of the rescue and recovery work this morning. If you look behind me, you can see the very remains, the skeletal remains of the World Trade Center. And one volunteer, Robert Gerlinski, explained to me the reason there's so little rubble is that all of it simply fell down into the ground and was pulverized, evaporated. What was that that he said? <laughs> fell down to the ground, was pulverized and evaporated. I don't mean to be making fun of these people at all. They're trying to explain what they see. They don't see enough debris. And they're trying to come up with some explanation as to where the building went. Actually, that video clip I saw that day, and that partially inspired the title of the book. Because why do people quit asking that question? Here's another short clip the following day. I was astonished at the degree to which solid materials were turned into pulverized dust as a consequence of that building collapse. I think it was striking. People were shocked. It did not make sense how much it was turned to dust. The top view of the, what was left, we have building three here, tower one, tower two. Building six, it had all these cylindrical cutouts in it. Approximately the middle 50% of that building is missing. Building five had cylindrical cutouts in it. Some circular cutouts there. Building seven went missing. The buildings on either side weren't really destroyed much. There, there was some stab wounds, I call it, it, some pieces of steel beam that went into this building, but essentially nothing happened to this building. The sidewalk in front of it didn't even get covered. And building four, that's when it often gets forgotten. The north wing of it seemed to be sliced off like with an exacto knife and the main body of the building just went missing. Just the north wing stayed, or that part of the north wing. Here's that remaining stub of the north wing of building four and looking at it directly on, here's what you would see. If you looked out of the, through the building across the street with binoculars, looked in, you could probably see what was left on someone's desk in there. Come to think of it, it reminded me of an image I saw as a child when my family drove through Topeka, Kansas the morning after that horrendous tornado that tore up a large par part of Topeka, Kansas. I remember seeing this apartment building, it was probably a dorm, but to a child it was an apartment building, sliced in two. Half of it was just gone, and the other half, like nothing happened. The bed was still made, magazines on the bedspread, 
some books on the dresser, and clothes hanging in the closet that did not look disturbed. No support under that floor, so I really don't think somebody went, walked in there and made the bed. It was just unsupported hanging there. And it also might remind you of the Pentagon. It's a clean slice. From ground level, here's what it looked like that day. There's just this little corner left. And after they cleaned up the corner, there is that sliced off part of the north wing. So here is what was left, this elevation map, but there's what should have been there, that ghost pattern. And if you notice, there's a little pimple down there at the bottom of building three. Fourteen folks survived down there. The rest of the building went away, and who was left in that little quarter there survived. Also, the bottom of Tower 1, that little hump there, that was Stairwell B. Fourteen people survived there as well. And one of them, when they came out, said this. I looked and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us. And now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. These are the biggest office buildings in the world, and I didn't see one desk or one chair or one phone, nothing. Another one talked about walking out onto an empty football field. Something I've often talked about is toilets. There should be at least 3,000 toilets in those buildings. Busted up toilets are easy to recognize. Recognizable parts, so you have all this gray dust, you should have some nice shiny sections of porcelain, assuming that is what they used. But you didn't see any. Not one bit. Again, here's the uh, cutout part of Building 6 and those other cylindrical holes. We're going to concentrate on the main body of Building 4 for, for a minute, because it's fascinating the way it just went missing. Here's an actual photograph of that area. There's that tiny little corner, but the rest of it just went missing. There's a Burger King across the street. They were still flipping burgers over there, <laughs> feeding the firefighters. The irony is just amazing. And right across the street from there, there's round holes in those windows. We'll see the pictures later. A rock goes through a window, it breaks the window, or a baseball goes through the window, it shatters the window. It doesn't make a perfectly round hole. Again, this is the elevation map. And right there, I found a picture just below ground where it, from the mall. There was a mall, the first level below ground. And then two more stories below that was the loading docks. And we'll also look at that. It was this shape, the, uh, the drive in here, and it was color coded. This area is purple to let the driver know he's under building five, and it was green under building four, so they would know where to park. And we're going to look down this way and see this intact end of that parking garage. Here they are walking one story below ground. This is innovation luggage, and this is Hallmark cards. They a little bit punched through over here, but it didn't go much below this level. This is down in the parking garage. Going down to the parking garage. We're in quite deep. These are the first pictures of search crews underneath the World Trade Center desperately looking for survivors. <laughs> That wasn't necessarily this area, but you hear that echo? Someone down there? You know, the echoes. That wasn't even a full parking garage. That echo was tremendous. So, again, the purple is under building five, green is under building four. Right above the end of that hallway is where that building went missing. Where'd it go? Mind you, that was also the location where the top of Tower 2 was tipping over and then it turned to dust, that's where it would have fallen. 
If the top 35 floors of Tower 2 had fallen to the ground, landed on Building 4, would it have looked like that? Now we're looking back from between Building 4 and 5 through the complex. There still well be where those folks survived, those 14 people who thought that when the building came apart, they thought they were so buried it would be forever till they could get to them and they'd be dead before workers could pull the rubble off of them. But then the dust cleared and they looked up at blue sky. There would be over a million tons of debris piled on the ground if those towers had slammed to the ground. Didn't happen. Looking from 180 degrees on the other side, again, here's stairwell B, the north and south facade. Where's the debris? There is some, okay, you got a few pieces of stuff here and there, but it's not the, anywhere near the amount to explain two 110-story buildings and the 22-story building. Where to go? One of the other um, folks who were trapped in stairwell B was calling out to be rescued and saying, uh, his buddies would call back and say, where are you? He said, stairwell B, tower one. Where? Tower one, stairwell B. Where are you? Stairwell B, tower one. It's, you know, like, what, what, why aren't you listening? And then the boys said, um, where's tower one? Where is the north tower? From the outside, you would wonder too. Mm -hmm. They were right in this little spot there. And they walked out. Once the dust cleared, they could see where they were going. Here's stairwell B in this area. There's the north wall of the north tower. This is a building six with the big gaping <coughs> hole in the metal. It's an eight-story building. What remains of the north wall of Tower 1 is about eight stories. Um, that was a 110-story building. So where are the other 102 stories of just the north wall? Not to mention what goes inside. And you can see over here where Building 7 had stood, it didn't even spill completely across that street onto the sidewalk. The post office, the wall, doesn't look like uh, stuff hit it. Doesn't look like a machine gun fired at it. If you're squashing down a 47-story building, that material has got to go somewhere. And it would be shot at, in order to get it smushed to the ground that amount of time, the material has to be launched out of there like Mach 1. But uh, that doesn't look like a machine gun hit it. Here's another image. Still will be north wall. And here we have the bathtub wall. We haven't talked about that yet. The bathtub held out the Hudson River and this building was very close to that wall. It's like having it next to a, a dike. If that building had slammed to the ground, it would have damaged that bathtub, ruptured it, and flooded Manhattan. Well, let's talk about what the bathtub is. Before, when the towers were first built, there was just the towers out there. They were built on bedrock 70 feet below the water table. And they extended out, you know, wanting to uh, get more real estate on Manhattan. And they, later they built more buildings out, but it was right at water level. And so there was this wall that kept the Hudson River from flowing in. Manhattan would have been flooded if that crashed to the ground. Here we're looking down 70 feet below the water table onto that bedrock. There's the bathtub wall. Here's the west side. The old shoreline used to be right about here. There's a map of it. There's the old shoreline. They basically built the towers in the Hudson River and built this dike all the way around. They called it bathtub wall, or sometimes they call it the slurry wall. In the early 1900s, as you can see, uh, 1909, 
they finished the path train station and the subway would go underneath the Hudson River, came up, turned around there and went back out. When they built the towers, they relocated inside this bathtub. And then you had the intersection with the uh, subways that went around Manhattan. This is all below the water table. So if you broke that bathtub wall, subways would be flooded, all of lower Manhattan would really be destroyed. Another image of it, and they're starting to build out and extend out here, which they later did and built the WFC buildings. And again, you can see down deep into the basement. And another image, you can see right here is the old shoreline. And they extended out from there. And after 9-11, they cleaned out the debris. Voila, a clean bathtub. I'm not saying there was zero damage, but there was no significant damage. There was water hoses being poured all over the, the quote, pile, <laughs> over the uh, debris field here. And it ran down into the tunnels. Here's a tunnel opening. And they were worried for a bit to see if it was leaking. But once they pumped it dry, it stayed dry. It was not damaged. And a view looking west. This is the new buildings they built when they extended it out further. This is the footprint of Tower 1, right here, right up against that wall. If that tower had fallen over, crashed down, whatever. If it had slammed to the ground any which way, it would have ruptured that bathtub wall. Mind you, that's an old wall. <laughs> now let's look at that third issue, the seismic impact. First of all, if you drop a bowling ball off the roof of the North Tower, without even considering air resistance, it's going to take 9.2 seconds to reach the bottom. This is time, and this is height. So here's the blue billiard ball. As you drop it down, of course it goes faster per time. It's going to take a little over nine seconds to hit the ground. That's a billiard ball with no resistance. But imagine if one floor has to fall and hit the next floor to hit the next floor, and so forth. Just looking at the timing. Well, as we saw, each time it hit, it turned to dust. There's all this dust pouring out. So looking at that timing, well, the building's damaged, so therefore it went faster. Let's overestimate the damage, well overestimate the damage. Let's say nine out of every 10 floors is hollow, it is missing. So the, fir the first floor will fall 10 stories before it hits the next one. But as soon as it hits, it turns to dust. And then, but let's assume it has enough energy to get the next one started. It doesn't, but let's assume it does. Then that one has to wait until the blue ball gets there to start that one going. And even at that, it's over 30 seconds. Imagine if it was every single floor, well over 100 seconds. But it takes time to put things in a trash compactor. Trash compactors don't work instantly to squash material. But even more interesting is uh, the length of time. It took eight seconds that the ground shook. How's that work? Only eight seconds the ground shook. If you get something you're hammering down, the ground should be shaken a good bit of that time. Even more noticeable, it's missing uh, anything beforehand. The seismic recordings would have reflected two 500,000 ton buildings slamming to the ground, but they did not. It didn't happen. One of the uh, emergency workers, one of the first responders, made this comment. I don't remember the sound of the building hitting the ground. Somebody told me that it measured on the Richter scale. I don't know how true that is. Because if a building is hitting the ground that hard, how do I not remember the sound of it? Buildings silently hitting the ground? Uh, 
I guess uh, this part of the building doesn't make a thud when it hits. The building is completely turned to dust or near completely turned to dust. It's not going to make a thud. It comes down like snow. In controlled demolitions, when a building slams the ground, that's when it is broken up and that's when the dust is created. This is an earthquake that was in Manhattan in January of that year on the same bedrock. It was in Midtown Manhattan. So we can test how that bedrock carries a signal. How does this look compared to that other chart? This has a whole lot more high frequency waves, a whole lot more uh, going on. That other one looks like it's over filtered or so, you know, something's weird about it, but worse than that, look at this. I, I call this the nozzle kind of leading up to the big signal. This is when the P wave arrives, the primary wave and then the secondary wave. And you can tell how far away an earthquake is by the delay of those. If it travels through the ground. If it doesn't travel through the ground, you don't get S wave and P waves. You only get surface waves. Now, let's look at the signal from Tower 1. No S wave and P wave arrival. Only surface waves. And look how much smoother it is. It's not that high frequency kind of rattling look. And it's approximately the same magnitude. This is a 2.3 instead of a 2.4. So we know that bedrock can transfer uh, seismic signals. So let's compare it to, well, first let's look at um, Tower 2. It had already gone by that point. But Tower 1, that's what it looked like on the overall scale. So 2.3. It should have been more, uh, much higher number. And then all afternoon there were still these uh, quarry blasts in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania that measured on the Richter scale. So we know that that uh, the seismic charts were working. And then the Fox Islands, there was an earthquake there. But just before that earthquake, Building 7 went away, dropped and turned to dust, its final demise. But what was most striking about that is that little red vertical line, that's when it happened. And there's nothing really that stands out and apart from background noise. Where's the signal for building seven? It should be at least this. The Seattle Kingdom was a controlled demolition. So let's analyze that. It's got a whole lot of data out there is the reason why I used it. Notice that the dust doesn't rise much above the highest point of the building. And afterwards, there's stuff left over. These are people down here, these little specs. So that's a lot of material that's left and you can recognize what it used to be. And this is the signal it leaves. Notice it has an S wave and a P wave arrival. And it lasts like 52 seconds for the majority of it. If you dropped a bowling ball off the roof of the kingdom, it would take about 3.9 seconds to hit the pavement below. It's a lot shorter. So we're just going to use that for a way to compare the length of signals. So let's average it to four seconds. But the major part of the ground shaking was nine seconds. There's a lot more that shook after that as the pile was probably readjusting and things were happening. And what was also interesting is the Seattle Times said, my gosh, it, it, the dust was in the air for almost 20 minutes. Uh, not 99 days. Here's the seismic signals from five different recording stations for Building 7. If you're real creative, you can pick out something from background noise, but not much. This station, nobody could pick anything out from background noise. Now, they calculated when the S and, and P waves were to arrive. They calculated that, but you don't see anything happening there just a hint of some disturbance in the surface wave. But again, this station 
They couldn't even guess. Now, this building is, has six times, or had six times the potential energy of the kingdom. It should have at least registered the same as the kingdom on the Richter scale, which was a 2.3, like building one registered. Building one was 30 times the potential energy. <clears throat> so here's the kingdom. We'll look at things relative to the other towers with that. If you turned all but the bottom 20 stories to dust of Tower 1, you would get approximately that seismic signal that we saw. Uh, not without the S&P wave, but the, the magnitude. And for the South Tower, if you dustified all but the bottom 16 stories, that would explain why we only had a 2.1 on the Richter scale. For building seven, that 0 0.6 on the Richter scale is like the bottom two and a half stories falling to the ground, just about nothing. With the new phenomenon, we need a new word to describe it. Because using a known term for a known phenomenon that doesn't apply to a new phenomenon is not scientific. For what happened to the towers, I've used the word dustification. I think it's pretty clear what it means. It's a new phenomenon. We haven't seen a building get dustified before. So if we're, just pretend for argument's sake, a collapse of some sort, whether it's a uh, you know, pancake collapse, whatnot. Uh, bombs, bombs have to shoot stuff out at a high speed. The point is, if this building is to get to the ground, in nine seconds, the material in this region has to go somewhere, has to shoot out at a tremendous speed. As it turns out, around Mach 1, depends on if you use eight seconds of the ground shook or nine seconds we calculate it would take. That's what the two differences are. If it was the eight seconds, somewhere around this level, it would exceed Mach 1, the average speed the stuff would have to shoot out of the building at. Up here, just right at the top of the building, it would already be exceeding Category 5 hurricane strength, the air pushing out of the building. And the center air traveling out would exceed Mach 2.5, somewhere near the bottom. So with this stuff, like somebody's Coke can on the windowsill, it's going to get launched at a tremendous speed and hit all of the adjacent buildings. It would be like a machine gun fire. That didn't happen. Only one uh, explanation I can think of would explain that. The building turned to dust. Another interesting phenomenon. This is building two being turned to dust. The top tips over shrinks up before the rest starts down. It even looks like this is tipping over and then it tips back a little bit. Many folks have probably seen that video. It looks like it um, violates the laws of conservation of momentum, but it doesn't necessarily. It does for a rigid body, but it's not a rigid body anymore. If the thing starts rotating and appears to stop rotating, but each of the little specks in it are rotating locally. It can maintain conservation of momentum, not break the laws of physics. So it implies that the top was turned to dust. And sure enough, I mean, the rest of the building is still standing here, but this turns to dust first. Which adds to another question. If before the tower gets destroyed, you have the same stress across here. If it tips, you have less stress on this back corner. You've unloaded the building. This building here is used to carrying a bunch of weight on it, and you've taken that weight off. Why is it going to collapse? <laughs> now, I've called this phenomenon Alka-Seltzer. An Alka-Seltzer tablet, take it out of the package and it's dry, 
and it'll stay looking the same, won't really change much, until you change its environment. If you drop it in a glass of water, it effervesces and dissolves. If you change its environment. This is steel. Steel usually doesn't uh, have dust shooting out the back of it. Perhaps its environment changed. And I'll point out, these are the pieces of aluminum cladding. They don't look as affected. But the steel, I call these wheat checks. Uh, one of the photographers called it that, and they look like wheat checks. What, you call them shreddies here? Yeah. That uh, it, they're three columns wide, three stories tall. They're prefabricated um, at, the, at the shop and then hauled out to the building and put in place prefabricated. So when the building came apart, it fell apart in those <coughs> prefabricated chunks. So here's a wheat checks falling to the ground. Turns out it never reached the ground. Turned to dust first. Here's a slow motion image of these pieces coming down. And a little bit uh, into it, you'll see a piece falling down this corner in front of it. That's the corner of Vesey Street and West Street. This is the one coming here. Yeah, you see this like a stick. Mm -hmm. Keep watching it. It turns to dust. In a minute, we're going to look down that intersection where this stuff should have landed. I have a faster one of this, but notice how all this is trailing dust. That's not from a dirty windowsill. Here's the faster one. It'll play a few times. You also see things squirting out as the <laughs> It moves down. But this piece is quite interesting how it turns dust. And this is the Verizon building. And we're looking at the intersection as West Street goes that way and Vesey Street goes this other way. And here's where it should have landed. This is right after the destruction of Tower One. These people were in their hiding places, apparently, and they've come out of their hiding places. Look at the body language. Hands at the side, hands on the hips, arms folded, arms at the sides. They're shocked. There should be a big building right there. Paper and dust. Yeah, there's a piece of aluminum cladding there, but I think there should be a little bit more material. We were looking down here from A1, from that direction. In this picture over here, we're looking from A2. That's the same intersection. There was just a sea of unburned paper and dust. And then this car park went into spontaneous combustion. It appeared to go into spontaneous combustion. So don't make any assumptions. We don't know what was happening, but you can see orange looking, what looks like flame, something glowing in there. Now we're going to look from B1 and B2 positions as well as from C at what's referred to as the spire. There's that clump of core columns from Tower 1 that seems to remain just a little bit after the rest and then turns to dust. I'm sort of expecting that that is, or suspicious, that, that is right above where those 14 people survived, who thought they would have been crushed and looked up and saw blue sky. Here's Tower 1 coming apart, and it peels away like peeling a banana, and left with these little, little spires sticking up. That's about 700 feet tall. It's got to be pretty strong to be standing unsupported that tall. Here's building seven, which is a 47-story building. It's like 650 feet tall, approximately. 
this has got to be over that. And here's a closer view. And then it starts to drop down and kind of faints. Mm -hmm. Turns to dust. Now, if that thing tipped over, it, it would take out a few blocks worth of buildings. How's it going to go straight down? You got a 700 foot hole in the ground to drop it into? Okay, for argument's sake, let's, let's pretend we do have a 700 foot hole we're going to drop it into. And you're saying that that's uh, dust that shook off it that settled back here? That's blue sky around that. That's not dust gradually settling. If dust is that fine to hang in the air, it, it wouldn't be settled on it in that amount of time. So we know it doesn't have much time at all for dust to settle on it. And right after that, here it is from a slightly different angle. It'll just faint. Just faints and dustifies. Pretty neat trick. Now we're going to look at still frames from yet a different position. Remember it peels away like a banana, leaves it exposed. Blue sky, crisp edges. That's not dust settling on it. And then it comes to the point where it no longer has crisp edges and dustifies. Now we're going to look at it from across the river, yet a different angle. You can see it turning to dust. You know, it isn't tipping over in any particular direction. Oh, let me back up on that one. Oops, I backed up too fast. Okay. See how the dust cloud is sort of wrapping around this building? It's a little bit more wrapped around. So you can tell there's not much time has passed between those two images. Another one of my terms is lather. I like lather in a shower, but you're not going to confuse that with what happened on 9-11. But it's a familiar word. It's a lot easier to remember than characteristic 2579-7A. So it's actually more scientific than an arbitrary term like that because you can identify it. Didn't it look like that Alka-Seltzer effect that was lather kind of pouring out? Well, it turns out the building's lathered up too. From ground to roof, one side and one side only. Not only that, this is building seven, the north face, and we have uh, busted out windows, but the, the fumes don't want to come out there. I'm just using fumes as generic, not saying smoke. We don't know what this is, but from ground to roof. And the wind that day was only like seven, eight to, or eight miles per hour. So it wasn't a stiff breeze. And you can see that by some wafting out this face. No, no. Go low to the corner. Oh. Doesn't come out this window. Comes out that one, but, but uh, comes out this one down here, but not up there. It's very energized. If it was uh, smoke from a fire inside, first of all, it wouldn't come out of the entire face of the building. And second of all, you have a bottleneck there. It goes for the path of least resistance. And you'd have something coming out there. <laughs> it's not pushing out. It's being sucked out, it looks like. We don't need to know what caused it to just be able to observe what's happening. That does not look like a fire pouring out a window. And that poured out of the building all afternoon for seven hours. That's a lot of material. Maybe that has to do with why it didn't make a thud when it hit the ground. So we're going to talk about the dust rollout. It's another interesting issue. 
guy's running down the street, dust cloud chasing him. A wall of dust. A wall of dust? If, if junk slammed to the ground, the dust rolls out from the ground. It doesn't come as a wall. Now, I saw this, it kind of made me think of getting the, the whole building, grinding it up and turning it into dust within some like glass walls. So you have all this froth in there and then you take away the sideboards and let it just move outward. Like it was already turned to dust before it was cut loose. And as it went down the street, it ran over people, didn't even burn, just left them covered with dust. This one is uh, particularly interesting, the contrast. Whitehead. But uh, these people were hit with dust, like you can see where his tie had been. The dust rolled a particular distance and then went up. Bob and Bree were in that apartment there and it was wonderful of them to have shared their video. They took a video of this dust cloud rolling out. It didn't quite touch the window and went up. Never touched the window, like within an inch or two. It was amazing. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, baby, how lovely. Uh, oh, my God. Come on, let's go to the other room. Yeah. Is this dangerous? I think it's just, I think it's just smoke. Is the air conditioner turned off in the room? And the, and the window's closed in the bedroom? People near the area are in an absolute crazy situation. The entire top of the building just collapsed. The entire the building, just building just collapsed. building just collapsed. We're going to leave because the smoke is coming right at us. Obviously, this is a devastating moment in our history. They're gone. The World Trade Center is, is no more. We do not know at this point uh, the extent of injuries or casualties, uh, how many people were in these buildings trying to get out. We've seen some. Oh, people are running away. They're running away. What are they going to do? You guys got to run away. I think it's going to be blown away from us. No, no, it's the wind is being blown away. Horrific, incredible. Not to do with Tuesday morning. We're looking at live pictures of the World Trade Center where just a few minutes ago, within the last minute actually, the second twin tower. Collapsed. Just to recap, if you're just joining us, around 8.42 Eastern time this morning here in New York City, a plane crashed into the right twin tower of the World Trade Center, about two feet of the way up the building, leaving a huge gaping hole, a huge fire, and tons of billowing smoke. About 25 minutes later, a second jet, believed to be a 727 or a 737, all these people running away. Yeah. The dust rolls out a particular distance. What would explain that? Well, I'm thinking if you throw rocks, they go pretty big distance. If you throw flour, dust, it doesn't go very far at all because it has a lot of surface area per mass, a lot of wind resistance, so dust doesn't go very far. But if you throw rocks and they become dust, in midair, at a particular rate, they'll reach maximum distance and stop going up. I mean, stop going out, and then if they're fine enough, they'll start going up. This dust went up. You can imagine people who are down in this area, total blackout. 100% of the sunlight was blocked out. This is a view, a couple of the um, frames from their video, you can see the dust rising. It rose like he spread it, never hit their window. This rose up. Really spooky looking. 
and other types of things kept breaking down and rising up. Here's water being misted onto what was left of ground zero, what was left of the debris field. And they brought in wet dirt, dumped it on it. This was Halloween, like six weeks later, after 9-11. This isn't fire. That's not what fire does. Wet dirt, dirt tracks. Also, if it were hot, you wouldn't put your uh, hydraulic equipment out there. Hydraulics uh, have per permanent damage if operated above like 82 centigrade. But that dust went up, or whatever it was, that, those fumes, I call it fumes just generically, like it was on a mission to go up. It almost looks like a funnel cloud. Dark stuff went westward. The whitish stuff went south and up to a certain altitude and then sort of wafts away. This is a close-up of that. And we have the toasted cars. This one was over on FDR Drive. Nice, healthy-looking tire. Uh, not so healthy-looking window trim. What happened to that car? We don't know where it was damaged, but there's a whole lot of them over here on FDR Drive, which is the opposite side from where the towers are located on Manhattan. And to get, give a little uh, closer look here, we're going to look at both sides. This is the right side of this police car. You have a very abrupt boundary between the toasted area and the not toasted area. By toasted, I'm not implying cause. It doesn't mean that it was burnt. Toast, it's history. You use that term here? It's toast. You, you can't fix it. You have to buy a new one or you can't repair it. So this is, something happened to this. The plastic lights on top, they didn't get cooked. So it doesn't appear to have been heat related. And the inside is very toasted all the way inside the door. But for some reason, that from here back, it's not toasted. And looking at the other side of the car, it has a spot that's not toasted. Here's a closer up view of it. Abrupt, like uh, it had a mask over it in the darkroom. One part was exposed and one part wasn't. But wait a minute, fire doesn't work like that. Fire, you have, you have the burnt area, the not burnt area, and then a transition in between like black and white and shades of gray. You don't have totally toasted, not toasted at all, one nanometer away from that boundary. Again, nice back tire. And the trunk lids popped up. I noticed that pattern as though the material that uh, latches the doors is one of the easiest materials to get destroyed. And it does seem material specific. In the center of where the towers were destroyed, like everything pretty much was, but as you move outward, things that are just partially affected. You know, what gets affected first? There's another interesting thing. I know uh, Andrew's talked about this. The upside down cars. I remember when I first showed Andrew this picture. I said, Andrew, why is the car upside down? Why is it parked upside down? Got trees over there. I swore. <laughs> What? I swore it out. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, police car here, but notice the upside down ones aren't as toasted on the bottom. It's like they either get toasted or they get flipped. You get some interesting tires sticking up in the air there, like it did a face plant in the street. And here's a, that night. You said you saw melted tour buses, melted cars? The cars that were right down there, it was just unbelievable. They were twisted and melted into nothing. The, build, the debris is just unbelievable. And then you can see fire trucks and police vehicles that were down there early, that um, all their windows, the windshield, are completely blown out. From Must have been from when debris dropped. But even more jarring, I think, uh, is this scene right here. Look at these two cars placed on top of one another. I think when you, when you think about it, the impact that uh, these planes must have had. It's hard to, to visualize um, it because everything melted. But here, at least you have some remnants. You have literally an engine 
that is melded together with other parts of the car. Moving over, you've got another car they moved here. It looks like it's been through a war. Uh, you can see uh, the papers, all the, uh, the burned out papers from the building. You see the soot and the dirt, and it just shows you how devastating this blast was. Look across the street there. Uh, you've got a Con Ed uh, truck that you know some of the Con Ed people now looking at, examining, trying to figure out uh, which truck that actually was. But that truck, too, uh, in terrible shape. Uh, so while many of the uh, items, the steel, uh, was literally melted, People who have been right down next to the base of what was the Trade Towers say there's virtually nothing left. Maybe a few flights of stairs, a few uh, stories of one of the buildings, but that when they came down there was so much melting and so much demolishing of any kind of structure that they cannot imagine uh, much being left or much hope of finding anybody alive. Uh, uh... Now, why did they have, um, why was it melted? But none of the people walking around there were burned. None of the paper was burned. Well, li very little of the paper was burned. A lot of unburned paper. So you were looking at the toasted cars. Patrick Connolly was right around the corner there when one of the towers was turning to dust. He had to head for cover, and he managed to get inside that door. This is Building 7. He went in there and started to go down to the bomb shelter in the basement and said, something's not right here. The bomb shelter was destroyed. Down in the basement. So he came out, <clears throat> couldn't really see where he was going, and starts heading up the road. And as he was heading up the road, making his way, thank goodness those cars went into spontaneous combustion, because then he had light and could see where he was going. It was total blackout. Notice the unburned paper all over the place. Here's where the towers were, FDR Drive. That's West Broadway. I sometimes refer to it as the swamp because it kind of looked like a swamp. With all the wet paper, you know, fire hoses on the paper and dust and junk, only the cars there were toasted. That's the toasted car park. FDR Drive. Now some folks believe that the cars were towed there. Well, not all of them were towed there. I don't know if any were, but I know some were not. There is a first responder down here who witnessed the spontaneous combustion of these cars. And like George Stephanopoulos' friend, was trying to explain it away and thought maybe a fireball got loose from one of the towers and rolled down the street and caught the cars on fire. That was the best he could come up with. Also, it was interesting is over here on the Manhattan Bridge, there were some first responders, some EMTs driving towards the World Trade Center. They said you could feel the heat from the bridge. It was so hot from the towers. But paper over here was not burned. How could you feel heat from there? I'll bet you felt something and interpreted as heat some kind of energy field because that's quite a distance away <clears throat> so now we're going to look at where Patrick Connolly walked up West Street at uh, West Broadway again there's the car park and there's West Broadway it goes right past building 7 so he came out of that door from building 7 and started walking up and this distance all the way up here just you know, end-to-end -end toasted cars. Here's Building 7. He came up to intersection C, turned left at that point. You can see from above toasted cars all the way up to here in a wet street with, you know, the mushy uh, wet paper and debris and so forth. Now, what caught the, all those cars on fire, if, they were, if you believe they're caught on fire? Falling debris from the towers? Well, why didn't it fall on these buildings? Only dust fell on those buildings. So how did the burning debris get down in the canyons? Yeah, that's a pretty deep canyon. 
Here's building seven. It was early enough in the day that you don't see any fire yet coming out of uh, building seven or any, it doesn't look like it's in distress. This bus, uh, to me, it doesn't look like it burned up. Burnt things usually look black. And then soot. I don't see any flame marks. This car here looks rusted. That's pretty fast for steel to rust. This is West Broadway. Notice the missing door handle. Missing engine. Go, go, go. Oh. Three, two. Oh, man. One. More debris falling from a nearby building, the World Trade Center. We're at West Broadway and Barclay. Very difficult to breathe here, but look around. This must have been ground zero where this thing blew up. Car after car after car. Buses completely obliterated and burned straight down to the steel. Behind me. That engine block? Wait, what? why would it be gone? That hood. Oops, I didn't need to go. There we go. So this is more of that same street. Missing door handles. Another one looks like the engine, something happened to it. Engine compartment. Rusty car. This is still early in the day. Building 7 is still in good shape. I don't know what that is. It kind of looks like a leg on the pavement there. But some strange things. Notice the, the trunk lids popped open. Uh, doors open like the latches disintegrate quickly. This police car is interesting. Right at the, where the door seam is, it's toasted back there, but not up in the front. As though the rubber gasket seals it, like, you know, electricity. Don't know. Nice tire. But uh, strange uh, disintegration or toasting. Now, folks say, well, yeah, car fires are like that. I can tell you the difference between these cars and a regular car fire. Look at this windshield, or lack of. It looks like it was wire brushed almost, ready for another paint job. Cars that have been burnt from a car fire, you'd find scraps of glass left in, in the corner somewhere. This is like everything gone. <clears throat> Here's the corner where Patrick Connolly turned. It was pitch black. You couldn't have seen your hand in front of your face if it weren't for whatever this was. It looks like fire. Now, it's things I call Cheetos. It looks like little Cheetos on the ground. I, I brought along from the United States example of Cheetos. <laughs> they look just like that. There's little orange things. Ah, now you know. What, what you call it, what's it here? <laughs> See how this looks like it's little orange glowing things. Now, you're not going to confuse that with snack food, but I'm pointing out that there's something weird about it, this orange thing. It doesn't really act like hot things would. And so I sometimes refer to this as a Cheeto fire. I don't want to make it assume that it's a regular fire. It may be, but maybe it isn't. This sure isn't regular. This is a, a contrast, high contrast version of this. Look at this fire on the what appears to be fire on the side of the van. What's burning? Just the side panel of the van has flames coming out of it. And I didn't see one bit of evidence showing a gas tank or a petrol tank exploded. They didn't seem to explode. It was something else going on. Paper, not burn. <laughs> Do you think they're used to seeing that? There's, uh, some of the, in some of the transcripts, they, they're saying, well, you know, we're waiting for so-and-so, so we just start putting out car fires. You know, what else is there to do? But it was also interesting, some of them said initially the water had no effect on these fires. 
Hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. Yes, hot things do glow, but just because it's glowing doesn't mean it's hot. I don't know if you have fireflies here. They glow. They glow probably from a chemical type thing. Also, there's, these are, I guess, incandescent bulbs, but there's also fluorescent bulbs. They produce heat from different mechanisms. Fluorescent bulb, you wouldn't want to unscrew it while it's hot. Fluorescent bulb, no problem. So it's a different mechanism. Thinking about that, all right, you have what appears to be unburned paper, something glowing. And someone in the, uh, the truther movement would often say, see, molten metal. Wait a minute, molten metal from heat? Oh, why isn't the paper burning? You get some of these orange Cheetos over here. And so as you have Cheetos sitting on paper, paper's not burning. That doesn't make sense. Another big thing with this is that this is aluminum cladding from the buildings. Pure aluminum melts at about 660 Fahrenheit, I mean centigrade. It's lower, slightly lower if it's um, an alloy. So no more than 660 centigrade, probably 600 centigrade is the melting temperature of the aluminum cladding, somewhere in the low 600s. Um, to get this much, you know, white hot, yellow hot, it's got to be like 1100 centigrade. You assume we have a problem. Why isn't this drooped over? The aluminum glows, but when it's a puddle. Here's a close-up view of this corner. It kind of looks like the aluminum is even glowing. But if this is white hot fire down here, that aluminum would be melted. So it appears that it's glowing for a reason other than heat. <coughs> now fluorescent bulbs uh, kind of a use of, of um, plasma instead of resistance heating uh, for the incandescent bulb. If this uh, debris field were hot, would you put an oxygen hose over it? And would you be standing at the other end with a cutting torch? That, that's you know, suicide, kaboom, but nobody blew up. So this is not from heat. What is this? I mean, these guys, if this was, was hot, it'd be like standing on your, your backyard grill. And they'd be like, uh, you know, grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> but they look like they're alive and well. So I wouldn't say it's hot. A lot of people have seen this uh, image saying, ah, it's proof of heat. Because somebody has this picture and labeled these points. On this picture that was partly a combination between NASA, USGS, and Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, one took a picture, one added something else, and so maybe something got lost along the way, or maybe it's correct data, but misinterpreted as thermal heat. This might be something else, some other interesting energy signal. So this point E, they say it's 819 Fahrenheit. Here's 819 Fahrenheit. See, the little lump there is building three, or the remains of it. Here's building three. There's a lake there. A water main broke, filled the street with water. And this guy is even walking around in knee-deep water. He doesn't look like a boiled chicken. Water boils at 212 Fahrenheit. So uh, that's not hot. Or it's not water. Again, this is the, the swamp, West Broadway. Lots of unburned paper. Bushy trees. Full foliage. Not burned. The buildings are not burned. Traffic lights. Potted in the ground. Are not burned or melted. Uh, this guy's engine had better days. Rear end here is kind of on the ground. So for several blocks, all the cars were toasted. No trees toasted, no buildings toasted, no signposts toasted. Do you see a pattern? 
Cars are up on rubber tires. They're insulated from the ground. Things that go into the ground are grounded. Maybe that has something to do with it. This is during the cleanup. You'll see spontaneous combustion over there. There's a closer up image, but here you have hydraulic equipment that isn't damaged. It's operational. Stuff would just light up. People would say this is fire burning for 99 days. Well, it's not hot fire. You know, that, that equipment, again, hydraulics are permanently damaged if operated over uh, 82 degrees centigrade, about 180 Fahrenheit. This one is The women go in and out of ground zero up to 10 times a night, often until 2 in the morning delivering whatever it is rescue workers need to do their jobs, like the ones working in the hot spots. Steel-toed boots is one of the biggest things. Um, steel-toed boots? Steel-toed boots. Out, still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours, um, and they're burning their feet. The guy's boots melt in a few hours. We have no reports of burned feet. Yet this statement was repeated over and over again. I don't blame these gals at all. They're trying to explain something. Boots are apparently disintegrating and they need to be replaced for some reason. But if it was 1100 degrees and these guys are walking around in boots that are melting, we should at least have a, a few reports of burned feet. As I like to say, my, if my steel oven is melting, the turkey inside is more than well done. <laughs> Yet this was repeated, kind of like the uh, buildings evaporated line. People don't realize that they are, hear something and they repeat it over and over again. We all do it to some extent, but it's hard to not do it. We, we're, we operate like a herd. We like to go with the herd. Rudy Giuliani also had made an interesting statement. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. I could be standing here and you could be standing there. And I could be describing to you, Governor, the, the, the site. And then a fire would break out in between us. And uh, it was just by luck or the design of God that we weren't killed. 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They're standing on a grill. And they're not cooked hotter than a grill. But there's something that reminded them of fire, and that was the best they could explain it, probably. So let's see, that's that one. Um, another phenomenon I talk about is rolled up carpets. Looks like that. You know, carpets come rolled up, but uh, how does that apply to the building? Well, looking at how the tower is constructed. It has these prefab units of three columns wide by three stories tall. And they're loaded axially. So if you overload them, whether the building is, uh, you know, steel gets too hot, so it can't hold the weight, or you co-op something down on it, it's going to buckle, whether it buckles in or out. It'll buckle, so it'll curve around the horizontal axis, like this. It'll bend around the it'll like bend over around the horizontal axis. Um, so why are these columns straight? Yeah, a nice hole in the ground there. It's empty. Not much else around, but straight. They weren't bent over. There were some columns that were bent, but when things you know, you probably squashed aluminum cans. You have a very sharp corner on them. Not smooth like that. And these are not even cracked. I don't know how you could bend that even if you heated it. A smooth bend like that without cracking it. More than 180 degrees. Those vertical columns were found bent around the vertical axis, not bent over around the horizontal axis. They were curved around the vertical axis. 
Doesn't make sense. They kind of look like a rolled up carpet. Straight columns, but they're, they're curled around the vertical axis. And uh, that sure doesn't look like a buckled column. It looks more like a piece of lasagna noodle. Some I-beams also curled around the vertical axis. Instead of, if you overloaded something, it would sag like that. So how, what explains this? And a smooth curvature. Hmm. Here's some columns of wheat checks falling down, a section of them. This is down where building six, uh, three is. This is tower two coming apart. This is higher up because you don't see building three yet. So this chunk here, as it falls, notice this zone here. You see the material is missing. So this thing came apart between these two images on its way down. Why? It wasn't overloaded. Then in Banker's Trust, there's this beam or column. I don't think there's any way you can mechanically load this beam to get what we saw. Loading it, however, does not do that. That looks like a rubber band that was snapped or something that was uh, melted or coiled up on one end. It's no fire in this building, and steel doesn't melt like that. It's got some holes there, but this wrinkling here, that cannot be explained by any mechanical loading. Proof of concept. Something caused this. I can't tell you what caused this because I'm not the one who ran the equipment. But I can show you some, uh, something that can replicate all of the effects we've seen. Here's these columns we saw at the World Trade Center. This is what someone has done in their lab. This metal is not uh, kinked, not buckled, smooth curvature. This is solid copper, about two and a half inches in diameter. And this is solid molybdenum. Here's that uh, lasagna noodle. Now we have uh, WFC1, what's interesting, again, no pockmarks in the surface from being like um, a machine gun. The windows are busted and the marble facade, 100% of the marble facade is missing, kind of like uh, porcelain toilets. And we have this parking problem in front. This car is toasted, but this one... Uh, mm has the tires go in the wrong direction. It's upside down. Doesn't look too toasted. The inner pane is still intact, but the outer pane is broken. Rocks don't do that. So we have evidence of levitation and toasting, or toasting or levitation. Here's evidence of, more evidence of levitation. And I picked up the camera just out of habit. And something in the back of my mind said, run, run, run. And never in 20 years of shooting in New York have I run from an assignment. But something in the back of my head just said, run. And as I hit the corner of Liberty Street, um, it was almost being picked up by a tornado. Almost being picked Except up. A wave. It was like being picked up. With a black cloud. That black cloud, cloud had substance. Mm. It was like night, but it had yeah. had a solid feel to it. It was like gravel, hot gravel, mm. and just picked me up and tossed me about a block. I just, at one second I was running, and the next second I was airborne. And I, I, I lost my glasses. I lost my cell phone. I lost my pager, but managed to hold on to both cameras. Mm. But it threw you for a block. I was back down at Ground Zero last week and walked the area where I have a pretty good recollection of where I was and where I wound up. 
and it was it was just under it was just under a city block. It was this blast of warm air. It wasn't hot. It was warm. And it picked me up and threw me up against the wall of the building that was you were picked up off the ground. Physically picked up off the ground. I remember an explosion. At that point I got knocked out. I don't remember anything. Then I got up and I looked out the window because the windows exploded and the street below caved in. There was an EMT who w was carried down some stairs. She didn't know how she got down there, so the uh, best explanation she'd come up with is that she died and God picked her up and carried her. She floated down the stairs. Also, those uh, first responders who were in the bottom stairwell of uh, stairwell B of Tower 1, while the tower was coming apart, they talked about having been floated up and down the stairs. They thought maybe they were being tossed, but they were going from the third floor to the fourth floor to the third floor. Here's what somebody reproduced in their lab. It's a toy boat here. They have water flying upward. Now, folks often say this, this guy is a hoax. He films everything upside down in a box. How do you do that with water? Can you hold the water to, the, to a box with a magnet? This water is wafting upward. That's just a taste. We'll come back to that. Let's look at the weather that day. <clears throat> it's a high pressure system moving eastward that they showed on the Fox News. They also showed on CBS, weather over Manhattan is nice as can be. Kind of interesting. Then we have Geraldo Rivera a year ago. He knows about all the hurricanes. For the past 40 years, he's celebrating of, of doing the news. They're reminiscing all the various hurricanes along the way. And this was just a year ago he, he said this. Morning. You know, people ask me why I have been so attracted over the years to hurricane coverage, but it, it, there's risk involved. There is, uh, you know, the peril of not knowing what's going to happen, mm -hmm. that adventure, and it's pitting yourself against the, an enemy. It's like war, only no one is shooting at you specifically. Uh, yeah, that's what the allure, but there is an area storm that I am not, that I, the juices don't flow, and you look yeah. and check it out. Look at that. Remember that? I, when that oh. I watched oh, that live. Oh, that live too. <laughs> and maybe a store on YouTube. Uh, you know, uh, you got to get up close okay? and personal. And Which, the, this is Hurricane Ike. I this uh, that was recent. That was uh, wasn't this uh, Rita? You would know. You know what I think it was Rita. Isn't Rita it? in Galveston, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Galveston. Oh, no. And uh, uh, you know, obviously Katrina before that changed so many of our histories. It was so so traumatic. You know, and it's well, one funny thing I think of. I think of if only a hurricane had come on 9/11. Remember, they didn't knew mm -hmm. how, they didn't know how to use instruments. The mm -hmm. terrorists they they took off in Boston, right. and they literally, after they took over the aircraft, they steered by line of sight. And it was that crystal clear September day. Sure was. Beautiful. And if it were only uh, one of these weather days, history would have been rewritten. And I think about that a lot now, and especially this time of year. So, are you we're the peak of hurricanes. Is. Yeah, you're celebrating 40 years. 40 yeah. years. Imagine that. Didn't 40 that? years. Every yeah, hurricane that he misses. He missed that one. This was on 9-11. There's the hurricane he wished for. There's New York, right off the end of Long Island. Cape Cod, it was actually raining that day. There was an airline attendant who flew out of Boston that morning. 
He didn't know there was a hurricane until he saw it on my website. He said that before they take off, they have kind of a powwow with the, the, the crew, the pilot, the flight attendants and so forth, about anything, any anomaly they need to deal with. No mention of a hurricane. Pretty interesting. That hurricane was the longest lived hurricane of the season, the first major hurricane of the season. Started out at the end of August. Came up this way in the four days leading up to 9-11, it went in a straight line to New York City. Eight o'clock in the morning, it pulls up, like pulled up to a chalk line, stopped. And turned around that afternoon and started heading out of town. While it was the closest point, it was the largest. Kind of unpacked, like a figure skater, kind of stops. And then got smaller again and head out of town. Kind of weird that we didn't hear about it. What do hurricanes do, after all? Well, here's a storm front. Here's the ground. You have a, like a static field between the two. Ahead of a, a hurricane or a weather system, you know, people often say they can feel the weather coming, they can feel the weather changing, because they feel that different energy system. And you often get dry thunder ahead of a weather system. It's sort of like uh, arcing between two points. You know, when you drag your feet along, coming up to, you know, across the carpet and come up to a door handle and reach out, you get a spark, it arcs across. It's kind of like that. Guess what? On 9-11, the three major airports surrounding Manhattan reported thunder. Men in uh, JFK Airport, LaGuardia Airport, and Newark Airports. So we know that hurricane was close enough to cause a static field around it. Here's what was shown on the four, these four networks. About 10 minutes to 15 minutes before the North Tower got its hole, before the first event of the day. So there's no reason to not have business as usual. I drew in these red arrows pointing out the lightning all around the perimeter of the country. Because there's this high pressure system and all around the edge of that you had an electrical storm going on. But here's what should have been shown. And a, weather, uh, a weatherman that I know, Scott Stevens, said like, how much, how much effort does it take to put an icon on the map? Here. This is the approximate size of the hurricane and the location at that moment. In full view, it's right against the coast. Let's look at the Earth's magnetic field. Oops. Several days before 9-11, it was kind of uneventful. Now, this was recorded in Alaska, ground-based magnetometers at six different locations. I also looked at satellite magnetometers. That was uneventful until about a day later, until the day after 9-11. So it, there was no um, uh, space storms, you know, the sun had, didn't have any coronal mass ejections or anything like that in this time period. These vertical lines are when each of the major events happened on 9-11. <clears throat> WTC-1 first gets its hole, and then WTC2 gets its hole. WTC2 goes poof, one goes poof, and building seven goes poof. But the key thing here is approaching this, notice about 20 minutes before the North Tower gets its hole, the magnetic field starts to shift downward. As soon as it gets its hole, it starts back upward. And as soon as the second tower gets its hole, it goes horizontally again. But it starts going downhill, really goes downhill after Tower 2 goes away, and then when Tower 1 goes poof, it really drops off its haywire all afternoon. Until Building 7 goes poof. Just coincidence, right? Then it's sort of back to normal, almost. Now, what was going on all during this time? All of that... Uh, the fumes and stuff were pouring out of Building 7. 
Like all the mass was pouring out of building seven, it was dustifying. So here's the magnetometer readings. Here is the weather reported at JFK Airport. Notice the humidity goes down in a linear pattern. This is the pressure, air pressure at JFK Airport. Notice it was going up because we had the high pressure system moving in. At the same time, the hurricane was moving in from the other direction. And guess when they met? 10 a.m. on the morning of 9-11. We have two counter-rotating systems. Um, hurricanes move one direction. High pressure systems in the northern hemisphere move the opposite direction. They sometimes call them anti-cyclones. So the hurricane's a cyclone and the um, high pressure system's an anti-cyclone. So two counter-rotating systems right over each other. Let's get back to more proof of concept. The Hutchison effect. John Hutchison's work reproduces all of these same effects, all of them, more than the ones that I've even shown you. A summary of the type of uh, effect, jellification, things turn into jelly. And then when, the, when you turn the gizmo off, they re-solidify if they haven't separated completely. And recall the curved beams and columns that weren't kinked or buckled or crackled. Bent beams, slow bending of metals, shredded metal structures, fractured metal structures, peeling appearance, like the metal's just peeled open, even though it's a, an extruded metal. Fusion of dissimilar materials, like um, paper, melt, looks like it's melted inside of steel. That's pretty weird. Thinning and rapid aging, lift or disruption, toasted looking metal, circular holes in material, like buildings, reduced mass of materials, rounded holes in glass, lather. There's a tremendous amount of, you know, weird fires. And then we have this fellow, George Piggott. He actually came up with this earlier. Do you realize 100 years today, his patent was granted on this technology. Today, 100 years. Here he is with his little bow tie on, observing his experiment. I think that's a, a kind of an interesting picture. He's got a static field generated. There's a Leyden jar somewhere. And he's got these balls suspended in that field. Levitation. Interesting, a static field. He applied for the patent in 1903. That was a long time ago. Thomas Townsend Brown did a lot of work on anti-gravity. Ed Leedscallon built Coral Castle in Florida. He's said to be, have been about 100 pounds, but he'd lift 15 ton stones, somehow. Here's part of Coral Castle. Here's the Great Pyramid, John Hutchison. Now, notice this person is standing at the base, about a little over one stone, maybe almost two of these stones tall, a little less, about the same height as that doorway in Coral Castle. Turns out the size of these stones is just about the same as, or the weight is just about the same as those of the Great Pyramid. Some of the stones that Ed Leedskalden lifted were even heavier than the heaviest stones at the Great Pyramid. How do you do that? A well, hundred pound guy? He had a little tripod with a chain on it that couldn't have held very many pounds. But he had that gizmo with the magnetic uh, flywheel. Now we're going to look at a sample of John Hutchison's work. See, he's still amongst us. He had another birthday a few days ago. He can demonstrate this in the here and now. I can't go back and visit George Piggott or Nikola Tesla. But I can go visit John Hutchison and see a demonstration of this. And here's an iron block, two inches by two inches by seven inches tall, solid iron. This is uh, what it used to be. 
Um, this thing buckles over. Notice the fumes coming off of it. It'll come off part way through, and we saw fumes coming out of a door handle. See this door handle? This is at uh, on 911. It's a broken window. If something needs to vent out, why doesn't it go out the window? <coughs> and John Hutchison's samples are a little bit cooler than ambient temperature after he's finished with them. It's not hot. Kind of reminds you of these, uh, what look to be fires, the Cheeto fires and Cheetos in the ground. They're orange, they're glowing, not necessarily hot. John has a boat, toy boat in the water. Notice when he turns the power off, you can see when it's going because the water jumps up. The boat goes into spontaneous combustion. So here's the water, he's got the signal going now, and then he turns it off, and then it ignites. Kind of like the toasted cars. They ignited after the tower was destroyed, immediately after. It's a plastic boat. What's catching on fire? This thing's kind of interesting. A solid piece of steel. Jelly. Now watch this piece of steel here, in this area, it'll come apart and move. He plugs this into a regular wall outlet. He's not efficient about it, he's not really a scientist, he just enjoys playing with this different type of technology. He tried to replicate the work of Nikola Tesla and he started discovering, hey this is fun. Let's see, we can make this thing fly up, up in the air. And so he does it with a sense of intuition and feel for how to mix the signals. What he does is create a static field, and within the static field, he interferes radio frequency signals, like microwave, as an example. It's not the microwave signal, and it's not the static field. It's the combination. It's kind of like a key opening a lock. Another kind of interesting uh, issue. This is right across from where that building went missing. Building four, right across the street from it. You have these round holes through one pane sometimes without breaking the inner pane. Holes here, they're roundish kind of holes. Some are look even more round. If you throw a baseball through, I'd love to see a kid ask the teacher this. Teacher, when I throw a baseball through the window, it looks like a spider web pattern. Why doesn't that look like that? Because when a rock hits a window, a mechanical load hits a window, it bends it. And glass is a brittle material that can't handle tension. And that outer edge, when it bows out, breaks from the tension. So what's going on here? This is actually done in someone's lab with longitudinal energy waves. This is kind of an analogy I drew. I drew. Imagine this, turn it sideways and drop a pebble into a pond and it sends a ripple out. Imagine something not a mechanical load but another kind of load that sends a ripple outward. I wonder if that's what makes that round hole. It is very rounded. Let's go back to look at it and keep jumping around because all these things kind of come together. Hurricane Andrew, there's a two before through the palm tree. How does that happen? Plywood. And I'm sure you've heard of straw through trees. But we're told, we don't know this, but we're told the straw is flying so fast it goes through trees. Does that make sense? You stop and think about it? Because force is force. Equal and opposite forces on the two. How can straw build up that much force to go through a tree? Well, it turns out that 
with John Hutchison's work, he's got this knife in this uh, aluminum block. He's also got a piece of wood in aluminum. Wood would burn up if you heated it hot enough to melt the aluminum. But they blend into each other. It's as though when the signal is turned on, I, I say it's a, sort of analogous to musical chairs. While the music's playing, people are walking around, you take one of the chairs away, and then when the music stops, people are supposed to sit back down, and somebody misses out because they don't have a chair. Well, think of the atoms and molecules like that. They're, they kind of let go and they're up and moving around when the music stops. They try to grab onto something and some of them miss out. And I think that explains some of the um, rustification that we see. But it, it explains also the jellification of some materials. Then when the signal stops, it re-solidifies. Let's think of what hurricanes and tornadoes do. It's a lot like a Tesla coil and creates, also creates a static field. Now these are a little bit uh, out of place, but it's um, interesting, this rustification here. So we're talking about, oh, it's, I guess actually it's in the right place, um, musical chairs. When the steel, uh, you know, the music's playing, the molecules and so forth let go of each other. Structural steel isn't just iron. It's mostly iron, but it has a few other doodads added in, like carbon, so forth, to help its structural properties and to help it uh, be more resistant to environmental effects. Steel does not rust that easily. Iron rusts instantly, just about. Get an iron skillet, leave it in your sinks with water in it. You come back, it's bright orange, unless it has a layer of grease or something on it. But it's easily rust, real quickly. Steel does not. So how do you get steel to rust like iron? Let's say it was uh, the musical chairs type of analogy was going on, and the stuff was floating around so much it didn't quite grab back in with the carbon uh, atoms and so forth, and it's turned into pure iron on the surface. Then it would rust like that. This is Banker's Trust. Banker's Trust was damaged. It didn't have a fire in it. It was right across the street from <coughs> Building 2. And they decided to repair it afterwards. They repaired it, and then they started taking it apart, dismantling it. And they took it down floor by floor, and they got down to that area where they had repaired it. And this was that region. That's where all the rust is. Pretty weird. That looks like it's been at the bottom of the ocean for a hundred years. So for those who uh, need to compare ideas, this, what I present is not a theory. I present evidence, and I have evidence of something that can mimic all the effects. I'm not saying it is that. I think the only person who knows is who pushed the button that day, but, uh, or who held the gun to their head to make them do it. Uh, but what we see is how we could replicate all the effects. Now, these are the bits of evidence that we have. These are the theories or speculations or hypotheses. They can't produce any of these effects. Matter of fact, to the contrary. You put a bomb in the basement, you break the bathtub. Bombs are hot. If you break the bathtub and water rushes in, you have a steam explosion. You also have a seismic signal with the big bomb in the basement. If you cut the building up for controlled demolition, drop it to the ground, you'd have a pile of rubble left. It just goes on and on. None of these things can explain any of those. So where do the towers go? Gone with the wind. I have a few other slides if you're interested in those. After this, I just put them in at the end. Um, what thermite does for anyone who's not cured of that idea? There's a slight problem with thermite. If thermite were used to destroy the towers, there's something missing. 
I don't know if you've heard this song before. It's Blinded by the light. Anyone in that area would have been blinded by the light, whether it's a nuke or a bunch of thermite. This is what thermites use for welding railroad tracks. It's also used for burning paper. Did you see the did you see above our heads? This is a tornado. Look above you, right here. Look at that. Oh my god. Oh, he's fucking the shot. Shoot. I'm shooting. Folks think of her of uh, tornadoes as being like a vortex that like a toilet draining that comes down from the sky. It's an energy field, a vortex type of energy field that happens to occur naturally. Uh, this one started from the ground up. It's a potential between the clouds and the ground. It turns out that there's a whole lot of similarities between this and what happened to 9/11. People talk about anti-gravity. And those who have been inside a tornado and picked up by one, they can breathe fine. It's not like a big vacuum cleaner. Hopefully they don't get too busted up. Let's see. It, you know, is that, now, now that you've seen all the slides, you look at this. Can you call that a collapse? That is a new process we've never seen before. This looks like a squirting out. Somebody... Or like a foam. It really wasn't that loud. And there's something else that uh, some folks have wanted me to talk about. Here's the hole in the North Tower. The plain shaped hole. I just, it's a hole. I don't go into why it's there what caused it. But what I would say is this little slot here, airplane wings can't do that. But up here at the 105th floor, notice that fellow. We're going to take a closer look. We heard about all these jumpers. There he is there. These guys over here, some have their shirt off, some have their pants off. Does that make sense if it's hot? Would they do it because of a bomb in the building? Would they do it because of fire? Why would they do that? And this fellow looks like he's taking his pants off. This is the 105th floor. Uh, okay, if he needs to take his pants off for some bizarre reason, we don't need to solve that for this question. Why doesn't he just step inside? Smoke, you say? Well, he could hold his breath, step inside, take the pants off, and get back out. So why does he do that? Why does he have to take his pants off while dangling from the 105th floor by like one hand and one foot? And the firefighters on the ground, those poor, poor guys, that must have been utter torment. They've been trained to save lives, and there was nothing they could do. They had to watch. There's one fellow that they talked about having to watch because he wanted to go out and start catching people. The, feeling helpless, I think, is about the worst human emotion there is. And they've been trained to save lives. And one, of several of the fellows said that there's like five a minute, four a minute, three a minute out of each face of the building. Let's estimate three a minute out of each face of the building the whole time. That's four, uh, three a minute, uh, four faces, that's 12 a minute. The building was standing for 100 minutes, that's 1,200 people. Left the North Tower, approximately. 
And uh, there was 343 firefighters that were killed at the basement. That's, add those together, that's 1,543. Guess how many separate people were identified? Just under 1,600. So it's approximately the number of people who left the building. What happened to people in the building? Probably the same as the rest. Now, what would cause you to do this? These people want to live, or else they wouldn't still be hanging on. And the firefighters had never seen people jump like this before. Maybe they'd seen, in all the 20 years on the forest, seen one jumper from a building, and that was like the third story. Nothing like this. Something different was going on. So if I'm up there and the building's on fire, I'm going to go to the bathroom as fast as I can before we lose water pressure and get myself wet. I'll be wet. Maybe if I have some extra clothing, soak that down, wrap it around my head and head for the door, head for the stairs. If the sprinklers came on, I'd be wet. If the sprinklers didn't come on, it was hot in there, I'd be wet. So it's a good chance these people are wet. Now, they have a lot of motivation to take their clothes off because firefighters wear extra clothes to protect them from fires. They don't fight fires in the nude. So there's something else going on there too. This isn't because they're hot. You know when you put, um, th this is just an example, not meant to be imply that's exactly what it was, but when you put uh, food on a paper plate in the oven, in the microwave oven, the chicken on the plate cooks, but the paper plate doesn't, if it doesn't have water molecules in it. If it's wet, then it heats up. Water molecules are affected more by microwave energy. It's a form of directed energy. Let's say there's some type of energy field within the building, maybe microwave. So if you were wet, wet clothing, you'd want to get those wet clothes off, or else you'd be feeling like you were being fried. Uh, crowd control, nowadays, they have this active denial system that microwaves a crowd, makes them want to just get out of there as fast as they can. So the active denial system, they call it. But um, really, this behavior seems explainable by some weird energy field within the building because they're hanging outside the building. Also, they want to take their clothes off outside the building. People hear about uh, uh, thermitic material being found in the dust. What's thermitic material? Well, we have a building that was turned to powder midair. What was the building made out of? It was a steel structure with aluminum cladding. Let's dustify that, turn the building into nano dust. You have aluminum and iron. Iron, that fine, is going to rust immediately. Guess what thermite is? This and this. So if we didn't have that in the dust, something more serious would be wrong. People will talk about hearing booms. Remember, hot things glow, but not everything that glows is hot. Bombs go boom, but not everything that goes boom is a bomb. It's a Scott tank. The air tanks the firefighters wore. There were quite a few firefighters who witnessed Scott tanks exploding at ground level that were in fire trucks. So, pretty much ends it. I would like to say something here. I am just kind of overwhelmed by you folks. An audience who wants to hear about this, who wants to understand, it just really warms my heart.
Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely awesome bit of research there. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. G. Wood.